Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Omer and today I want to talk about trust issues. Or better, how we build an authorization system that developer didn't hate that much. They still hate it a bit. <laughs> and before I start talking about the why, uh, the what we build, I want to talk about why we had to build a new authorization system instead of the one we already have. So I said my name is Omer, and I'm from Israel, uh, living in the south of Israel, like you see in the picture. Um, and every day I uh, travel to my home on the train, and usually I use the, tra the train time. <laughs> yeah, this is how trains look like in Israel. <laughs> anyway, I use the, the time in the train to work on uh, various stuff that I need to work on. Just for a second, just setting up the clock, which I forgot to do. Uh, so I was on the train, I was walking, uh, it was actually exactly one year ago, and then I got a message on Slack, which I'm sure happened to us all the time. And it was a pretty disturbing message. A colleague of mine sent me a message that, while he accidentally looking on GitHub, he find a production secret on a public GitHub repository, a secret that allows access to all our production services. Yeah, <laughs> this was not that good. Um, and this is how I responded. And of course, I started to do all the things you need to do when you find a buyer about something like that. Uh, pinging my manager and all the other people, talking with GitHub security, deleting the repository, revoking the secret, and all that. And after a few, a few days, we did a postmortem because it was a production incident and we wanted to talk about what happened, how it happened, and what we can do so the next time it will happen, the damage will be lower. And there are a few action items from this postmortem. And the first one was about detection. In this case, the detection was manual, and it was pretty luck we find out about that. It was just because someone was looking it up on GitHub. And we wanted to have a tool like Git Guardian, for example, if you're familiar with them, that could help with that. The second action item is pretty much the stock. Uh, we want to build a better authorization system that will make sure the next time the damage will be lower. And the third case is about audit. We are using Azure Active Directory uh, for service-to-service -service authentication. So I asked Azure, hey, do you have audit logs for who used a, to a secret to access a token? And they were like, no. <laughs> and this was very surprising because it's very important to have such audit logs. Um, <laughs> So I understand we need to do our own edit logs because Azure don't do that. Again, surprising. But we also need another kind of audit logs, which is why a person had a secret, why he need a secret, who allow him to create a secret, and all those stuff. And all these stuff are things I'm going to talk about in this talk, and how we build an authorization system that allows us to do all that. And just one last introduction. I already said my name. I'm Omar. And as you can see, I always like to build stuff from a really young age. I'm doing it professionally for the last 10 years. And in the last five years, I'm working at Ceruto. I started there as a developer, and in the last four years, I did the shift to DevOps, DevSecOps, and all those dark areas. Um, Ceruto uh, purchased by Asurion. Who heard about Asurion? Okay, so Asurion is a very big insurance company in the state. And we basically like to help anyone with the technology they have at home. For example, um, two months ago, I buffed um, Apple TV, and I couldn't figure out how to turn it on, so I just take it out from the power and put it in again every time I wanted to watch TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one day, my brother saw me doing it, and he was like, what are you doing? I couldn't figure out how to turn it on, so he showed me. So this is the kind of stuff we're doing at Ashura and helping everyone with those issues. And we have a chat system we build with a lot of microservices running on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm going to focus on Kubernetes, but it's a pretty generic talk, so you can apply the same thing to other systems if you're not using Kubernetes. So we have a lot of microservices. This is just some examples of what we have. And they all talk with each other, which bring the questions of authorization, how we are going to handle authorization uh, between those microservices. And the classic approach, which is what also do, is the fourth approach. 
In the fourth approach, basically, we are going to assume that all the services has the same level of trust. We don't trust users or requests coming outside the cluster, so we're going to have very strong authorization for any outside request. But all the requests going inside have the same level of trust. So the authentication service, for example, can talk with anyone in the cluster. And this might make sense until you have a problem like what happened to us, where one host take down our entire fort, or in our case, one leaked secret caused a really huge production issue. And this is why we want to know the blast radius. Uh, blast radius, like the name implies, is how many services are affected, for example, from one vulnerability. In our case, it was everyone, uh, which is not that good, uh, <laughs> of course. Uh, and it's especially true in DevOps environment where Dev commits stuff to production periodically. So you cannot know for sure that all the code is trustworthy, and you cannot review everything goes into production. Um, so we wanted to change the approach to something I like to call a zero trust approach. Um, a bit more paranoidic, where we trust no one. So if this was what we have now, before we want to move to a stage where we do authorization for everything. So the authentication service could talk only with user's API, but not with notification API, because it doesn't need to. And you can take it even further. It can only get user data, for example, but not create it. Um, so we started to think about the ideal system. Uh, so I talked about list privilege, all the permission, just the permissions you need and not more, only post, not get, only this specific pet, only this service. We also wanted to be secure by default. If you create a new service, it doesn't have to have, it has no permissions, it doesn't need to access anything, and no one can access it. Uh, we don't want to block developers. It's really important that they will continue working it will not be blocked each time you try to build something. And finally, stay, scale. We talk about hundreds of services going on, and we want to make easy deploy to all of them. And this is the most important thing. This is not what we want. I don't want each time developers trying to do something. This is what they feel. Computers say, no, you can't do it. So let's try to build it and see what we need for that. This is what we did. You can see it's very simple, just a few things going around, nothing interesting. Um, no I'm kidding. It's a really complex system, so let's go to look on each one of the components and see how it all looks together. And we start with this component. Uh, a pod in Kubernetes is like a VM. Please don't kill me. I said it for the uh, explanation. Uh, but let's say it's a VM and it can run stuff, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes. And we have three uh, processes here, our app, Envoy and uh, Open Policy Agent. So let's look on each one of them. Envoy is a reverse proxy. It's a CNCF project, and it can do a lot of cool stuff with incoming or outgoing traffic, like retries or all that kind of stuff. And it can also handle authentication and authorization. Uh, we can run it as a sidecar. So the most cool part in that is that it doesn't matter in which language you write your service. Even if you write it in Scala or Elixir or whatever, it will still work. And you don't need to re-implement authentication uh, each time you write a new service. Um, and Envoy has the concept of request filters. Request filter is something that runs on the request and can either uh, change something in the request or basically return an answer. So we can use it also for authentication. Uh, as you can see, Envoy has a very, very complex configuration, and it took me a lot of time to build it. It was like four hours of wanting to kill myself because it's really hard. Uh, this is an example of JWT authentication for, uh, filter. Let's look a bit on it. Uh, so first, we need to define a few properties on the token. We want this issuer, we want this audience, and all that stuff. We also need to define where we want to get the public keys from. So this is our authorization server. And finally, we can define which route should be authenticated and which not. So we can define here routes that don't need authentication or different JWT providers for different routes. And now that we have authentication, we can move to authorization, which we can do with Open Policy Agent. It's another CNCF project. It's an open policy system. 
it used a DSL called Rego. And it has integration with Envoy, and we can see all that now in the demo. And for the demo, I'm going to solve a problem for all the parents here. So who has kids? OK. Uh, so you're probably familiar with the candy problem. Daddy, can I have a candy? And I had this problem, so I want Opa to solve this for me. So I will not have to be the bad guy, but Opa will be the, the one denying the request. So let's see how we can do that. What happened to my Mac? Oh. Okay. Okay. So this is the very basic uh, policy you can write. It's a very dummy one. It's always return true, which is not that good as a parenting decision, but some work with that. Um, and basically, we can call OPA and ask, I want the decision for the policy OPA, DEMA, A, allow. So if I will run this request, I will get true, because this is the policy. This is really not interesting, so let's see something more interesting than that. And this is a more dynamic policy. Here I take the input from the user, and based on the input, I can decide how many candies, if the candies are allowed or not. For example, I can decide that five is the maximum. And here I can provide the input. So you can see that I have candies four. In this case, it will be allowed or denied. Allowed. So let's see if you're right. And of course, we got true. And if I will put seven here, we will get false, like expected. This is a bit more interesting, but let's make, take it even further. And this is a really dynamic policy. Uh, I can say that different kids have different policies. So instead of having hard-coded number of candies, I have it in a data file in a JSON, because we are JSON engineering. And we define here two kids, Joe and Maya. Joe can have five, Maya can have three candies. And in the policy, I can take again the input from the user, look for the kid name, and then look for the kid with this name. And then based on the kid, I can decide how many candies he can, he can get or not get. And that was the end of the demo. <laughs> OK. Ah, oh, it's back. OK. Uh, what? Too many candies, yeah. Uh, as long as it's not blue skin of that, everything is good. Uh, anyway, Maya, who remember if Maya can have four candies or not? Someone remember? Maya can't have four candies, I think. Let's see. And of course, we get false if we change it to Joe. This is going to be challenging. We will get true because Joe can have four candies. And of course, if we put Seven here, we will get false. So this is the power of OPA, and it lets us auto policies that are really, really powerful. And the last thing I wanted to show is this thing, the decision ID. Each time OPA uh, auto a decision, it's log, a specific log called decision log with all the data about the request, including the ID of the decision. So we can use, let her use it either for audit or the bug process or whatever we need. Happened here. Okay, this is really weird. Anyway, so we solved the Kenny's problem, and now let's see how we can take OPA and use it for service to service authorization. Uh, so I already talked about how OPA can connect with Envoy, uh, and it's another kind of request filter that uses external authorization system. So basically, we tell Envoy for each incoming request, after you validated the JWT token, pass the request to OPA as input. And then, based on the response from OPA, decide if the request is authorized or denied. This is how we defined it. Again, really ugly Envoy YAML file. Um, this is the interesting part. Basically, I told Envoy, send the request to this gRPC server. And, and this is the input. OPA will get this JSON for each policy. It's a really huge JSON containing anything you have on the request. The path, the method, the token, or the claims in the token, the client IP, whatever come with the request. And now we can write our policy. So let's ignore all the 
first lines because they are not really interesting. And this is our least privileged policy. I can now, for example, decide that only this client with the ID client from the token is allowed and to only this path and only this method. And now I can go on and on and on and add more uh, policies like that and give me exactly what I wanted. Uh, so now we have the least privilege we wanted. And the same is true for secure by default. Because if there is nothing there, the allow will be false. But it's still not perfect because Rego is a bit ugly, let's be serious. And we can't expect all the developers to learn Rego just so they can do authorization. Uh, and this is where abstraction come in handy, and I don't know what happened to the meme that was here, but there was supposed to be a meme here about abstraction. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we need to put some sort of abstraction on the Rego, so they will not hate us. And this is where the data feature come in handy. We can create a JSON file describing the exactly same data. We have the client here, the pet, and all that. And then write a generic policy that based on the data file, decide if the request is allowed or denied. So it's pretty much like before, just this time we use the data file. And now all the devs need to do is edit the JSON file. They don't need to know that Rego even exists. And if we talk about how our, our repository is going to look like, so we are going to have one folder for each service containing the data file of this service, the list of clients that allow to access it. We have a shared policies folder, and this is the most important folder. You want your security team to look on each commit going to there because it's affecting all your services. So you want to have a really careful review there. And on the last part, I'm going to talk in a minute. And yes, this is a menu repo, which has uh, its own pawns and cons. For example, if you have one centralized repository with all your uh, policies, it's a lot, other, a lot easier to govern it, and access request is a lot easier. You don't need to figure out where is the service repo. You have one repository, you need to open PR for each service you need. You don't need to go, you, not, you don't need to go to look to all the repositories in the company to request access. On the other hand, you um, split the repositories away from the code, which might not be that good for developers. So this is an example PR. A developer add a request, add a service, and you can review it. So let's look how we can review it. This is a PR that a developer requested access to a specific uh, uh, service. And you can see that you can easily see that she asks ask request to all pets. So I asked her why, and she just wasn't aware of it. And of course, the next thing is write static analysis on that, because it's really simple to look for um, everything. Uh, and this is the next thing we can do. Uh, so things are a lot is better now. Um, and we have something that is a bit better for developer, but how we can take that and scale that across hundreds of microservices. And this is where another uh, feature of OPA come in handy. Uh, and this is where we're going to talk about the last folder called discovery. Uh, OPA has two features that are really important here. The first is what's called bundle. Bundle are just archives of policies, and you can, OPA can um, download them dynamically without the need to restart it. So um, you can define a, a discovery service uh, and use that to dynamically decide which policy to download. And this is an example of OPA configuration file. Uh, this is how I defined where my policies are stored. It can be S3, Azure Blob, menu, whatever. All you need to do is to upload those bundles to the service. Uh, this is how I defined labels. The labels is how we can do the dynamic discovery. So for example, I can decide that for Kubernetes I have one policy and I can do, I can use any labels I want and create different policies based on uh, those labels. And finally, I can define the discovery, which is just another policy that do the, the dynamic loading. So this is the discovery uh, policy. Um, and there are multiple parts here. In the first, I just define the common policy that we talked about, the one containing the actual Rego code. And then I want the policy for this service. And this is where I use the app name from the labels. 
So based on the service name, I will serve the right data, JSON, the data file. And this is how I can scale it across all our services. And finally, I have generic OPA config that is not really interesting. So everything is good. And now we need to talk about logging. I already talked about decision logs and what we can use them for. Um, and uh, it also has support for redacting. So if you pass the body to the, to the decision and it gets logged, you can write another policy that redacts this stuff. And we can use FluentD, Loki, FluentBit, whatever you like to collect this log and create a graph from it. This is a production graph we have. Basically, what I did here is I used FluentD to parse the log and send it to Graphite. So for each decision, I have the, the deny or approve. And this is something our SOC team can use to, for example, get an alert if we have a lot of denies. And we also have a really good audit logs now for anything that happened, include who used the token. So this is something we can use to cover about that, that Azure don't have it, which is, again, really disappointing. And we also have audit on GitHub, so we can see who approved the request to the service to access other services and all that. Um, so now we can go back to the system. And we basically have two, flow, two flows here. The first is the developer flow. Uh, the developer just commits the request to GitHub. We have regular PR review flow. Uh, Codefresh bundle it, upload it to S3, Azure Blob, Minio, whatever you want to use and OPA periodically download new bundles from the S3. So basically, once you committed it to GitHub, it's live in production. There is no need to restart or anything like that. Uh, when a request is coming, it goes to Envoy. Envoy do authentication, ask OPA. OPA, based on the policy, denied or approved the request and logged everything, and Loki or Fluentd collect it. So now we're actually done, and we have all those stuff. But we didn't talk about something really important, which is testing, right? It looks really good, but we need still to test it, especially because uh, it's a really important part of our system. And if we have a bug in our policies, everything is down. So OPA is support for unit test. This is an example of test you can write in Rego. Uh, for example, I can check that if the method is not allowed in the JSON, we actually get denied. Uh, and this allows us to get more confident in the common policy we write. And OPA also has support for coverage. So basically, I can say, if the coverage of the test go below 90%, block the test. And this allows me to ensure excuse, sorry, that even in a year from now, we still have good tests that covering all our policies. And this is what we saw in the PR. We have two tests running on each change and showing that our policies are still valid and useful. But this is not enough. There are a lot of moving parts here. And testing only the policies is not enough. For example, someone can misconfigure Envoy, so we just approve everything. Or misconfigure OPA, so we just return true everywhere. Um, and it's really hard to test complex system. And one approach here is testing in production, like chaos engineering, just for uh, security. Um, so for example, there is a Zap operator, or a Zap operator that I wrote, and you can use it to easily attack your production system and use that as passive sec, or when in the future we will have JWT Fuzzer to ensure that your system stays secure over the time. So this is an example of how you can use the Zap operator to attack the production service. And this will basically launch a new Zap that will proxy 5% of the traffic going through your service and look for issues. And this can give us, give us another type of confidence in our systems. So now we can actually done. But it's important to say that it's still not perfect. For example, let's talk about money. We have OPA and Envoy, two more containers running on each pod. So if you have 200 pods, you have now, sorry, <laughs> it will take him a minute, 400 more containers running in production. And it's a lot of money. 
just think about that, that if each one of them take 100 millicore, it's a lot of cores that you are going to add just for authentication and authorization. So this is a trade-off that you need to think of. If you want to go with solution, it's not free. There is something that you need to pay off. Uh, for us, the trade-off was good enough because uh, it gave us a solution that, other than that, was pretty hard to get. And another thing to, to get is that if there is now a production bug in OPA, for example, all your services are down. We had a production incident two months ago because of OPA. One of our services stops, uh, stopped working in the middle of the night because OPA just died. Um, <laughs> so this is the downside of using those tools. Take your trade-off. Anyway, if you do want to use it, uh, there is a demo repo. All the example code I show here, all the YAML files, all the policies, everything is there. So you can just go on the README, uh, run it on Minikube, kind, whatever you like, and then use it as a production reference. And there is also a link to a blog post I wrote describing most of the thing I talked about here. Uh, so you can also use it as a production reference later to build something for you. And of course, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, wrapping up, we started with uh, this postmortem, and I think we're now in a lot better place. If something like that will happen again, the damage will be lower, and we get what we wanted. Uh, but we still want to move forward. For example, I talked about how OPA can load new policies in runtime. But this has its own issues, because I imagine you are investigating a production incident in the middle of the night, and you don't know that someone changed a policy, and because of that, all your requests are failing, which is not that good. So we want to give good visibility to developers about policy changes that could affect their production environment. We also want to write more complex policies. For example, I imagine that you want to build a policy based on user properties. So you want to take the user ID from the JWT, go to user service, fetch the user details, and paste all that with the request to the policy. This is a really cool policy that we want to write, and OPA support it. And finally, we want to expand adoption and get to a situation where all our services use it, and this is the default. Uh, so now we have this system. And if you have questions, I think it will be more beneficial if you just come talk with me. Uh, and that's it. If you get any value from this talk, I will really appreciate your feedback so I could build it better. I started with talking about trends, uh, so let's do something inspirational with trends. Uh, OPA allows us to move faster without breaking too much stuff, and I think it can do the same for you. So thank you.